The Things We All Carry is a podcast about first responders and their stories surrounding trauma on the job. The intention of this podcast is to raise awareness and share meaningful conversation around a subject often viewed as taboo or simply ignored. Be aware this content may be graphic and it is real. It may not be suitable for children or adults triggered by this subject matter. Welcome to episode 77 of The Things We All Carry. I received an Instagram message out of the blue one day. It caught my attention by calling out the lip service paid to mental health by many people in the positions of leadership. The message started off with this, and I quote, These woke ass fire chiefs that act like they give a fuck about our mental health with their stupid surveys and awareness days haven't even begun to enact change. Needless to say, I was interested and I definitely wanted to hear more. Ryan is a firefighter in Washington, D.C., His experiences with work and life demonstrate a need for a global approach to mental health. We can't only worry about the calls. We need to be in tune with all aspects of life for a firefighter. Knowing what trials and tribulations a firefighter is living through and dealing with allows us as peers and leaders to better serve our people. Ryan dealt with cancer and death in an up-close and personal manner. He was thrust into a caretaker role at a point in time he could never have imagined being necessary. He discusses the realities of caring for a loved one as cancer rages and death approaches. There are moments of beauty and grace sprinkled among the indignity of death. He doesn't pull punches when sharing the uglier side of cancer and hospice. He also shares how this experience has changed his approach at work and the reactions he has had to certain calls. Separate into two worlds, firehouse and personal life is difficult in the best of times. However, when tragedy strikes, it's damn near impossible. A quick reminder to please help us build a community which not only recognizes, but supports each other through the struggles and recovery. Reach out through Instagram at the things we all carry or email my story at the things we all carry.com to offer support and share your story please remember to leave a review on itunes and give a shout out to any first responder you know love or care about y'all enjoy the show And that, my I guess my only question was, do you want me to say from DC or just leave it? Just I don't no, know. from from DC. No, from DC is fine. Okay, cool. All right, well, if you're ready, let's do it. Okay. All right, well, welcome back. Thanks for joining me. I have Ryan, and he runs in DC right now, and he's gonna. Well, he reached out to me the day that I I put a call out for people who might want to record on the spur of the moment, and uh, we've kind of bounced around, kind of tag. And uh, we finally found a time today to record, and, and you're going to hear most, well, most of what you hear will be new to me as well. I, I know the bare bones of his story, but he's here to share the rest of it. So thanks for joining me, Ryan. I appreciate you, man. First of all, I want to know, what was the last song you heard? Uh, so, Gratitude by Brandon Lake. It's actually, uh, it's a Christian song. Um my relationship with religion has been extremely strange uh, up until recently. And uh, I've been trying to to focus on just being present in the moment, like enjoying the things that, I, you know, I can control and forgetting about the shit that I can't control. And the, you know, the song is called Gratitude by Brandon Lake. Uh, and uh, yeah, it's, I, I'm trying to listen to it every day now. Perfect. I've been asking people about it. And so I just, I love music and it just hit me. It's like, why am I not, why am I not asking these guys and, and women that, that come on the show, what they're listening to and, and broadening people's horizons with music. So I appreciate that. Yep. So tell me about, uh, growing up, where'd you grow up? Uh, so I grew up in small town, Delaware. Uh, I lived in Camden, Delaware, most of my entire life. Uh, you know, if you're not familiar with Delaware, you can get from one end of the state and the other, uh, to the other in about two hours. Now there's not a whole lot going on. Uh, but you know, growing up, I had a lot of close friends. So, so what, what was family life like? Uh, family life was amazing. Uh, I can't, I'm not one of those guys who grew up with a rough childhood. My parents have been married for 45 years. They're still together. Uh, they're still both alive. Um, uh, we grew up in a small house and, uh, we sat down for family dinner every night. Uh, my dad, you know, he's a super laid back, 
uh, well liked guy. Uh, you know, a lot of my friends would end up either living at our house or, you know, being over here all the time, you know, their families were going to divorce or whatever. And I, I had the, you know, a normal family. I mean, it was, I can't complain. It was great. We were tight. My parents worked hard. They sacrificed a lot, uh, for my sister and I, and, uh, in that fashion, I'm, I'm truly blessed. Did you always know you wanted to be a firefighter? No, I didn't figure that out until later in life. Um, when I graduated high school, I have ADHD real bad. So when I graduated high school, you know, once I got my driver's license, I realized that, uh, you know, keep my ass parked on one spot was going to be difficult. And that, uh, <laughs> if I went to college, I was going to waste my parents' money until I, you know, matured a little bit. So right out of high school, I went to the United States Marine Corps. Uh, I would say that was the start of some of my mental health issues. Um, you know, people listening right now probably go, oh shit, he's serving in combat. I didn't get to do any of that. Um, I went to the Marine Corps in 2003, so the war in Iraq had just kicked off. Um, it's just by chance, I got a hernia in a training accident. And uh, the surgery to fix that hernia didn't go so well either, so I ended up with a nerve entrapment. Um, ultimately, long story short, because there's nothing exciting in between there except for some chronic pain and uh, a little bit of opioid addiction uh, that I was able to overcome. I was medically discharged a year and a half early from the Marine Corps. Um, so at that point, I was kind of lost. I was still young, technically fresh out of high school. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do. I knew that I wanted to serve. Um, I just didn't know at what capacity. And at the time, I thought I wanted to be a police officer. Um, so I started working for this water company. And I was applying with different police departments. And if you're not familiar with Delaware, uh, they're not hiring a ton of people at one time. So it's super competitive. You know, it's really hard to get in. They're picking, the, you know, the cream of the crop, uh, hire one or two people. So I, I did that for a few years. And then one of my buddies was like, look, dude, you got to have some volunteer hours on your resume. Uh, why don't you start riding down to the local fire department with me uh, at the tick house or the volunteer house? And uh, I'm like, all right, man. So in high school, I'm, you know, I feel like a dickhead for saying this, but in high school, I would see these kids sitting out on the front ramp of the the firehouse on a Friday or Saturday night. And I'm like, oh, look at these nerds, you know, sitting out here on a Friday night. What do they know? You know, I'm going to party. I'm cool. <laughs> so I started riding and I'm like, dude, this is fun. Like, I actually enjoy doing this. And I went to my first structure fire. I want to say I had like four months in uh, riding. I went to my first structure fire. It was a Mercedes shop across from the junior high school. And uh, I remember driving past on my way home from work. Pager goes off. I go back, you know, I'm holding ass back to the firehouse and smokes bank down across the block. I actually almost ran the town cop over. <laughs> and uh, I get to the firehouse and I get in the back of the truck and it's just me and one other dude. And he's like, you know, he's kind of fucking around. And I'm like, hey, man, I, you know, this thing's on fire. He's like, for real? I'm like, yeah, it's, it's you know, it's off. So we get there, it's fire blowing out every crack. The first, first two engines, they got a line, you know, trying to get to the front bay doors. And there was one little tiny door that didn't have any fire coming out of it. And it's, you know, this dude's like, hey, man, you ever put a fire out? I'm like, bro, I, you know, I've been doing this for four months. I have no fucking idea what I'm doing. <laughs> Aaron does. So he hands me the line, which, of course, that makes total sense. It makes no sense if you're a fireman. <laughs> right. I'm like, oh, this, what a nice guy. You know what I mean? So he hands me the line. And we go inside and there's cars in the building. There's propane tanks. And oh, Jesus. We're all fired. And uh, burnt the shit out of my gear. And, I mean, we were there for a while. And I remember coming out and I was like, some, somebody's going to pay me to do this. Like, this, this is what I want to do. Like, I've never felt alive like that. And, uh, I mean, if you're a fireman, you know, you understand, you understand the feeling of going inside a structure fire. That's what we live for. And I, I tell everybody, I'm like, I don't want your house to burn down. I don't want anybody's house to burn down. I don't care if it's section eight or the nicest house in the neighborhood. I don't want your house and belongings to catch on fire. But if they do, I want to be there. And I think that every fireman can relate to that. Yep. Um, so after that, uh, uh, you know, I was just on a mission to get hired by the fire department. And I, I went to EMT school. I started taking the uh, uh, pro board classes at the fire school. Also, uh, District Columbia Fire Department had a veterans hiring event uh, that my buddy who had already started working for DC told me about. And it wasn't like the traditional hiring process where you go take the test and all the other bullshit. And then you're on a list for three years waiting to get hired. and they, uh, they had us down to the armory, filled out some paperwork. Uh, I think there was 400 of us. They picked 30, or I'm sorry, they picked 60 out of that group. 
sent us down to the training school. We filled out some more paperwork, filled out our psyche valve bullshit. And then they hired 30 of us. And it, it was like a maybe three month process before they called me and offered me the job. So, I mean, essentially I was handed to me on a silver platter and I, I'm forever grateful for that because honestly, with as broken as I was when I got out of the Marine Corps, I don't know if I had the discipline uh, to stay the course, to, you know, to keep going after that goal. I think I would eventually got there, but at that point in my life, it was so easy for me to get burned out and just give up. Uh, um, that I don't, I don't know if I would be working for DC right now if that hadn't happened to me. So I'm, I'm definitely grateful for that. And you say broken. I know you mentioned you, you had the, the surgery and the, the, the you had little brush, I guess you're going to call it with, with addiction to opiates. Oh, uh, is yep. that, is that what you're talking about in general? That, that is that the broken part? So, uh, it was, it was mentally. So had the little brush with the, uh, that, you know, the Navy's solution, cause they did our, our medical, you know, our good government healthcare and, uh, their solution was, well, you're in chronic pain all the time. So we're going to give you Percocet. And they gave me enough Percocet for, you know, me and my roommate in the barracks to be addicted to that cramp. Um, I kicked the habit, you know, when I knew I was getting out of the Marine Corps because they fixed the nerve that was trapped, um, was, some re I don't even know the medical procedure. It was, you know, so long ago. Uh, but basically they put a, a needle in my back and shocked this nerve and whatever. Um, so it fixed it. Took a while for it to, the pain to slowly go away. It, it basically killed that nerve essentially. It made me non-deployable. So that's why they still, because it wasn't guaranteed that it wasn't going to come back eventually at some point in my life. Um, so that's why they discharged me. And the broken part is just mentally. Like I, you know, I wanted to serve. Um, I was a, uh, just junior in high school when, uh, I'm sorry, I was a sophomore in high school when 9-11 happened. And, uh, I really wanted to serve and, and being discharged medically from the Marine Corps just brought shame. Obviously I had nothing to be ashamed about now that I can look back on it and everything happens for a reason. Um, but the amount of shame that I felt, you know, there's dudes getting killed in Iraq and, and, uh, here I am just fucking off in North Carolina, you know, basically doing whatever, just waiting on to get, you know, waiting on getting discharged. Um, so I get out and I start working for a water company and I, you know, sold my dreams for, uh, for a decent pay or a good paycheck and a pension. And, uh, I, I was miserable at my job. I hated my job and just mentally, like I was just, I was drinking all the time. Um, you know, I was living with my parents and then when I didn't live with my parents, I moved out, I was living with a buddy. He drank all the time and I uh, just, I was walking around with no purpose in life. So yeah, when I say I was broken, that's, that's what I mean. So this short little, or not short, abbreviated, you know, entrance into, to the fire department, that definitely comes as a benefit. Yes. Yeah. Because at the time I, I just needed a break and that was my lucky break. Um, because I mean, obviously there's guys that stand outside of the armory when they gave the test there for hours. And, you know, thousands of them showed up and then these dudes end up on a waiting list for several years. And here I am because I was a veteran and, you know, our fire chief had gotten some grant. Um, they picked, picked us all up like, you know, within a couple of months. Uh, and it was, it was the push that I needed. So, but the, I guess we have to kind of backtrack too, because, um, my wife, Natasha, the one that passed away, she did play a role in that, um, with the, you know, the whole volunteering thing. And, Chasing my dreams to be a cop. Um, so I, I don't know where you want to go from here. If you want to jump back or. Well, wait, was she your wife when you, when you joined the, the fire service? So she was my girlfriend. Yes. Girlfriend. Okay. So tell us about her and tell us about, you know, that relationship and how it progresses. And, and I don't know if you, if we can c kind of do it concurrently with the, the, the fire story, it's however you want to yep. tell it. That's it's your story, man. So I'll, I'll let you tell it how you feel is the best way to tell it. Okay. So yeah, so I, I was working for the water company and, uh, just put a cab met her, uh, went to a wedding and everybody there was trying to hook me up with her and she was the maid of honor. And, uh, I can remember <laughs> they, all the bridesmaids had these orange dresses on they were hideous. And, uh, but she, <laughs> she was, she was killing that dress and, you know, everybody's attention was on her, just the way she was bouncing around the room. And, um, but, and I was like, dude, there's no way this girl's going to give me the time of day. Like she's beautiful. Um, she's popular. She's charismatic. Here I am just some bum working for the water company that, you know, 
was going out drinking, you know, just basically living to go out drinking on the weekends. And uh, so any long story short, we ended up talking uh, at a bar after the wedding was over, talked for a long time. I gave her my phone number uh, on a piece of paper. And when we went another way, she threw my phone number in the trash cans. <laughs> so, a couple months goes by and I guess she saw me somewhere and uh, she reached out to me and we started, uh, we started hanging out. It was, it was instant, man. It was like, she brought this piece into my world that, um, <clears throat> that, uh, I hadn't felt before. And, uh, she gave me a purpose and she had come from, you know, a rough childhood and, uh, you know, the only close people she had in her life were her two sisters and uh, her friends, but her childhood was super rough. And uh, I think my family, like my, my family brought her peace. And she brought me peace and gave me a purpose in this world. Um, I ended up getting burned out and I, I came home from work one day and, you know, I'm covered in dirt and I'm, I'm bitching. And, uh, I, I don't even know what I was complaining about, but she had just got home from work and she was the manager of this, uh, pool chemical store. And she's like, can I ask you a question? I'm like, what's up? She's like, what are you doing to better your life right now? And I was like, uh, excuse me. She's like, what, what are you actively doing to make your life better? Are you? What dreams are you chasing? What goals are you trying to attain? I was like, I mean, and she was like, you're not, you're not doing anything. She was like, all you do is complain. She was like, I have enough on my plate. She was like, until you're actively trying to make your life better, I, I don't want to hear you bitch about work anymore. And I, I was, and she was not like that. She was a peaceful, such a super sweet person. And I, I was blindsided. I'm quick, you know, my initial reaction was like, damn, man, fuck you. Like, don't talk to me like that. You don't know. And then I, you know, I, she walked away and went to go upstairs and take a shower. And I was sitting there on it. I'm like, you're right. I'm not, I'm not doing shit. I'm just sitting here complaining, feeling sorry for myself. And that, that's not going to, that's not going to get you anywhere. Um, so that's when I started taking the classes, uh, you know, signing for the volunteer firehouse. I was, you know, applying more police departments. I started taking the classes. So I graduated EMT school and, uh, I get a part-time gig as a fireman up North here in Delaware. Uh, so I would get off from the water company, go there. And I remember we were celebrating her, uh, finishing her college degree at my parents' house. And I bought her some diamond earrings. We're all sitting at the table and, um, this is her day. And, um, I apologize. No, you're good. Um, take your time. She was like, we need to take a break and talk about something. She was like about all the stuff that Brian's accomplished in the last several months. And she was like, I've never been more proud of a man or more proud to be with a man in my entire life. And she was sobbing when she said this. And I'm like, to me, I'm like, dude, I got a fucking volunteer spot. Or 99% of the shit I'm doing is riding the ambulance and taking people to the hospital. And it was at a slow firehouse up north there. And uh, it didn't, it didn't mean anything to me. Yeah, I was, it was just another step in there. And I was so focused on the big picture. And to hear that come out of her mouth, uh, it definitely lit a fire in my ass. And uh, that's what really pushed me to start reaching out farther with, you know, applying with Baltimore City and, you know, some of the bigger departments. I really put myself out there. And uh, ultimately is what led me getting hired on uh, with Washington, D.C. Uh, so I'll, I go to the training academy, uh, in July of 2013, they, uh, they had initially told me it was going to start in October. I think they called me like July 8th and said, Hey, do you accept this position? But it, you know, the caveat is it starts on the 15th. I was in my work truck. I turned around went, and I'll put my two weeks notice in and, you know, they just let me go right there. Cause they knew, um, so I go, to, I go to rookie school. It was nine half months long. Uh, I was in there with, uh, I believe, 29 other veterans. Real tight knit class. And uh, finished rookie school. And, and I get to, I get appointed to truck 13. Another guy in my class got appointed to engine 10 on the same shift. I got appointed to the ladder truck. And uh, yeah, so I get there. And obviously, um, if you're familiar with the city, you know, engine 10 and truck 13, it's one of the premier houses. It's the best house in the city. Uh, super fucking busy, uh, real aggressive dudes, solid fire. The whole, every shift's got a solid fireman on it. Um, the camaraderie, the brotherhood, it's just, you can't, 
being in one of those firehouses in DC is, uh, I don't even know how to put it. It's, um, it's an honor to get to experience that in your lifetime, man, because it's, it's just true traditional, you know, fire department brotherhood yeah. and, uh, the shit that you learn, even as a rookie puts you light years, you know, light years ahead of everybody else in other departments or even at slower firehouses in the city. Um, so fast forward, I, you know, I get on probation, finish all that. And I had a couple years on the job and, uh, you know, Natasha and I had delayed getting, uh, getting married because, uh, so we got engaged right before I went to the fire academy. We delayed getting married because of my probation and the fire academy. And she started a new career where she was traveling a lot. Um, so October 15th, I'm sorry, October 17th in 2015. Uh, I get married to Natasha, um, you know, it was the best day of my life. I mean, we had a great relationship. Um, you know, we didn't fight. We were just, we were best friends. And, uh, so we get married in October. So from October, like the middle of October till Thanksgiving, I always take off every year. It's like my reset month. Uh, I spend a lot of time up in the Shenandoah mountains. I do a lot of hunting, uh, hiking and camping. And I just, it was my first shit back to work after Thanksgiving. And I was riding the, um, riding the shit box or riding the ambulance. And she calls me and she, you know, she says, Hey, I got this pain underneath my right rib and I can feel it in my shoulder blade. She was like, isn't that what happened when you're, you know, you had an issue with your gallbladder. And I'm like, well, yeah. And she was like, all right, I'm going to go to the walk-in clinic. So she calls me back and, uh. She's like, Hey, I'm, I'm leaving the walk-in clinic. She was like, they think I have a blood clot in my lung. They were going to call an ambulance. Um, she was like, but I refused. And she was like, I'm driving up to, there was a satellite ER where the dude I work with his wife work. She's like, I'm going to drive up there. So I'm not waiting all night. And, uh, she's like, but don't worry. I'm fine. Like everything's be cool. You don't have to come home from work. It's your first tour back. Like, don't worry about me. I'll keep you updated. So look, all right, baby. And, uh, I hang up the phone, whole ass back to the firehouse. I walk in, my lieutenant standing there. And I was like, Hey Lou, uh, you know, Natasha might have a blood clot in her lungs. I got to go. He's like, cool, go ahead. So uh, I didn't even take my shit off the ambulance. I just got my car and rolled out and, uh, made record time back to Delaware. And, uh, so I, <clears throat> I pull up to the ER and she is collapsed on the sidewalk out front crying. And I'm like, what the fuck? So I reach my car next to the sidewalk and I get out and, uh, you know, I pick her up off the ground and I'm, I'm like, what's wrong? She was like, I don't have a blood clot. She was like, but when they did the CAT scan, they found tumors all over my spine and in my ribs and, you know, basically metastasized all of her bones. And I'm like, what? And she was like, she was like, there's, she said there's several dozen of them on my spine and in my ribs and on my sternum. So I'm like, all right. So we get home. Obviously, we know something's fucked up. You know, it's this, this only a month after our wedding. And um, so we get referred to um, an oncologist up in the Helen Graham Center in Delaware. And uh, they knew she had cancer. Uh, they weren't sure where it originated or what kind it was because, the, the, you know, the tumors on her bones were just, you know, from where the metastasized and spread already. Uh, so because of the holidays and, you know, getting in that appointments, it wasn't until January we go up there and they, they had just done a biopsy off of the biggest tumor that was on her hip. And, um, you know, the oncologist were sitting in this room, she's laying on the table and I'm sitting in the chair next to the table. And the oncologist is like, look, you have, uh, you have, ah, I mean, I forget what it's called, like signature. It's basically, it's a stomach cancer that you can't see on a PET scan unless it metastasizes to somewhere else. So it's like the signet ring cell, a dose and carcinoma or some shit, but it's, it's stomach cancer. And I'm like, okay, so what stage is it? And she's like, well, I knew from the day you guys walked in here because it had already spread that it was stage four. So in my mind, I'm like, okay, now, now what, like, what's, what do we do to fight this? She's like, I have to tell you that, um, the prognosis is six months to two years with treatment mm -hmm. and there's, there's, there's no cure. 
it's, just, it's not one of the cancers that you beat. She didn't say that. She said six months to two years with treatment and that there's no cure. And um, she said, basically, our focus is on, you know, quality of life while you're still here. And I just, like that fight or flight feeling, like when you know you're about to get in a fight. Yeah. Your, your blood gets cold. And uh, I just looked over and, you know, here I am feeling the way I'm feeling. I look over at my wife and she's just laying there fucking bewildered, just got handed a death sentence. And um, so <clears throat> I get up on the table with her and I'm laying there next to her. And I was like, dog, I, like, we don't give a fuck what you say. Like, we're going to beat this. And that was just the start of that attitude as um like we're not accepting that prognosis like we can't we can't accept that like we just got married we didn't even go on our honeymoon because we delayed it because of life like we're oh there's always tomorrow well there's not um so that was one of my questions i'm like can we go on a honeymoon before we get started on this shit i was like we never got this she was like no she was like we need to start treatment immediately um this you know this cancer is super aggressive and we need to start now so you know we, we get up and we went and stopped at her sister's house on the way south, told her everything. And then we come to her parents' house and we tell them everything. And then we're getting ready to get up and go home. And uh, when she stood up, two of her vertebrae in her back that had tumors all over them collapsed and broke. So I get her in my car. We go, uh, we go straight to the hospital up north um, because the, the cancer center is attached to it. It's Christian Hospital in Delaware. And, uh, this is when we meet the nurses and doctors up on, uh, at the time it was the 6B unit, which is the oncology unit. Yes. Those fucking people on that floor are angels, man. And, um, we get there and the nurses could just tell by my face that I wasn't leaving. And it was, it was getting later at night. So they shut the whole room down. They gave me a bed in the room with her. And, um, the doctor, your oncology shows up in the middle of the night. And, uh, she says, look, we're, you know, this is kind of a blessing. We're going to start treatment now. And, uh, you know, instead of having to wait two weeks, she was like, we can start you on the chemo right now. And, um, the biggest, one of the biggest blows that Natasha got during this process is that, uh, you know, we talked about having children, you know, shortly after we got married. So one of the nurses comes in and she's like, Hey, did they talk to you about your fertility? And we're like, no, she was like, the nurse is like, look, I'm going to have to tell you this. She was like, because the, they, the doctor seemed to forget this part. She was like. The chemo and the radiation is going to destroy any chance you have of having a child. Like it's, it, you can't, it's going to, you know, kill all your fertile eggs. And uh, so they had a fertility specialist come up and they were like, look, basically it's going to be out of pocket. If you want to harvest her eggs, uh, you know, it's going to cost you like 30 something thousand dollars, but it's going to delay treatment by, uh, I want to say it was several weeks up to a month. And, um, after talking over with the doctors and they were like, look, you don't have a month. To, to do this. And, uh, so together we made the decision, uh, that, you know, I, I told her, I'm like, look, we, there's, there's a bunch of different ways that we can have children together, but we can't have children together if you're not here. And, uh, so we elected to start treatment. So they hooked her up to that. Her first IV drip chemo right there in the, in the hospital room. And, uh, she asked everybody to leave. I was in there and. The, the cry that the sounds that she made when she sobbed, knowing that any chance of having a child or her, her like that was, you know, half hers, half her DNA. Um, I've never heard a human being make those sounds in my entire life. Um, and she told the nurse, she was like, I don't want to feel. She was like, I don't want to be awake for the next couple of days. She's like, I don't give a fuck what you guys have to give me to make that happen. She was like, I'll take all the drugs. So basically she slept for several days while, you know, I mean, it just, the knowledge of that just crushed her spirit. Um, so we spent two weeks there at that time. I get her home, uh, obviously from being bedridden for two weeks, she had to learn how to walk all over again, you know, and now she's got tumors in her femurs and her back was broken. Uh, with the compression fractures, there's nothing really they could do about that other than put her in a brace. Um, so during that time period, I'd, I'd called the firehouse. Uh, I called the wagon driver on my, on my shift. 
and uh, he's a you know close friend of mine. And I told him, I'm like, look, man, um, Natasha's got six months to two years, and they you know they they think because of how aggressive this is and how much it's already spread, it's going to be a lot shorter than that. Um, he said, all right. He was like, we already we've already been planning on this. He was like, you know, I talked to your lieutenant. He was like, we've talked to the you know the battalion chief and the deputy fire chief. Everybody's on board. He said, we do not need your ass to come to work unless we fuck call you. He's like, we got you signed up for PFL already, uh, which is a city's paid family leave. And he's like, we've already had a roster up. And uh, he's like, most of your shifts for the next several months are already covered. Oh, um, and I. Like the relief that provided me to have that part of my life, to, to not have to worry about work. And not have to worry about coming here and taking runs and dealing with all the bullshit that we deal with work and all the stuff that we have to see and being, you know, an hour and a half away from her. Um, knowing that she was laying in the hospital bed at the house because she couldn't get upstairs anymore. I, I can't tell you what that did for my for my spirit and the and the just to make my job easier, you know, taking care of her on it. Ultimately, in the end, they ended up working seven and a half months and my shifts were covered. Not one of them wasn't covered. Um, you can't, like, you can't buy time, but the fire department gave it to me. And that's something that I owe this brotherhood for the rest of my life. Um, so I'll try to speed this up. Um, Don't worry about it. Take there, your time. There was, um, you know, people see cancer on TV. And, uh, you know, or the movies or whatever, you know, the, you know, a woman gets, you know, finds out she's sick or the, whoever finds out they're sick and, uh, then they lose her hair and then they kind of transition and it's just peaceful. The cancer that Natasha had was the most fucking, and I, and, you know, if, if you're a sensitive person, like I wouldn't continue to listen from here, but like, it was the most degrading, humiliating, painful way I've ever seen a human being die that have to suffer mentally and physically the way that she did. Like, I don't care who you are. Nobody, nobody deserves that. And I kept that from people because, you know, the fire department, uh, they put on a benefit here in my hometown. Here I'm some fucking new guy with a f f four years on the job. And, um, you know, our union president's there and there's five, 600 people with this benefit. They ended up raising between all the fundraisers the fire department had for me. You know, they're raising like $80,000 to help with our medical expenses and the gas and all that other shit. Um, you know, and there's deputy fire chiefs and there was a captain there. Who's, you know, got more time on the job as a captain than I've been alive. Um, you know, the pipes and drums and it's, I was making these Facebook posts, you know, updating everybody and, you know, the, you know, trying to be as positive as possible. And like, you know, this is what happened this week. And people are following along, along <clears throat> excuse me, following along with our story and, it was just, I didn't feel right at the time, like saying all the fucked up shit that was happening. Um, but like, you know, we get home and from the pain medicine, you know, she was constipated all the time, you know, as her husband at 30 years old, and she, you know, she was 29, 30 at the time. Um, I, I, I mean, this is just going to be too much information, but I want to throw all this out there. Like, I would have to put suppositories in her ass for her. Like, do you, do you realize how humiliating that is to have to have your husband do that? You, you, you just got married. And, uh, you know, that, that way she wouldn't have to go to the hospital for constipation. I had to help her get dressed. I had to help her shower. Um, I, you know, I had to wait on her hand and foot, which that was fine with me. I love that. That, that, that job gave me purpose. It, I never thought negatively of that, but for her being an independent woman, you know, and successful and driven, like it was degrading for her. And, and she, it really frustrated the hell out of her. Um, I lost my train of thought, dude. I'm sorry. No, you're um, good. You're all right. So I, anyways, I wasn't putting the stuff out there on social media. It was all about hope and, and prayer and, you know, God and, and beating this and you know how this is how badass Natasha was this week and she's a fucking warrior and like cancer can't fuck with her and you know we had this huge following and it was great because it was giving her hope to see all these people that are rooting for um and it was giving her a reason to fight and this this woman like 
early on, she looked at me and she's like, I don't want to know. She was like, whatever you research and find out about this cancer, she's like, I don't want to fucking know. You keep that to yourself. I'm going to fight. That's all I need to know. I don't need anything that's going to, that's going to knock me off, you know, where I'm at right now. She's like, I don't want to know if I'm going to die next week or 10 years from now. I don't want to know. She's like, I want to focus on fighting. And, um, so then to have all these people in the fire department just rally behind her, just gave her so much hope. And it's, I can't be grateful enough for the community, you know, between the fire department brotherhood and you know, our actual community and our friends and family that came together and, and kept her fighting because they gave her, they gave her a purpose. Um, but back to like the cancer thing and it not being the peaceful, you know, graceful thing that you see in movies. Um, sometimes she would go weeks without getting a shower because we couldn't get her upstairs, you know, both for our full bathrooms are upstairs and she just couldn't get up there and I couldn't, you know, carry her wasn't an option because her back was broken, you know, constantly. Um, so when we get her upstairs to get her a shower, it was a small, it was a small victory. And, uh, so one day I finally get her up there, get her a shower. We get her all cleaned up. She comes downstairs and we had her hospital bed in the living room. And then I was sleeping on like half of our sectional couch that I had against the other wall. Cause I were, I told her, I was like, I'm not going upstairs and leaving you down here. And, uh, so she lays down on my, my chunk of the sectional and she fell asleep and she, I'm just going to say bluntly, she shit all over herself in the sectional. And, you know, I come out of the bathroom, she's like sobbing, crying. And, uh, I just picked her up, you know, as best as I could without hurting her, brought her back to Sarah, got her in the shower, got it cleaned up. And I never told anybody about that. Um, but those, those are the images that haunted me for a long time after she died because I was so focused on taking care of her that I wasn't focused on like the good shit that happened, you know, even while she was sick and those, those images until I started talking about them and, and putting them out there, n nobody wants to hear about that, but I had to get that shit off my chest or it was going to fucking kill me inside because those are the things. When I thought of her name, that's the only thing that I could see. It's like those fucked up things that happened while she was sick that I didn't tell anybody about for four or five years after she died. Um, so we go through a summer and uh, her chemo wasn't working. Uh, so they put her on stronger chemo and this is where her hair started falling out. She started getting like the chipmunk cheeks from the, the steroids and... Uh, I wasn't going to say shit about her hair. Like it, it was getting pretty thin and, uh, she was holding on for dear life. And, you know, I can't say shit because I did the same thing when I was going bald. <laughs> uh, you know, that's how I got my nickname too. is because I was holding on to that fucking little bit of hair on the top of my head. <laughs> uh, so one night she comes to me and she's like, I'm, she had her medical marijuana card. She's like, I'm going to get stoned as fuck. And we're going to go out back on the porch and you're going to shake my head. And I was like, okay. So we go out there and, uh, I started shaving her head and she started sobbing. Cause as you can imagine for a woman, you know, that's a really rough thing to go, you know, to have to lose your hair. Um, it was bad enough for me as a man to go bald, you know, but, uh, it, she sobbed the entire time. I cried the entire time. And I'm telling you, man, like once I got all that hair off her head, I've never seen a more beautiful bald woman in my entire life. Like she fucking killed it. Um, and, uh, it took some getting used to for her, but then she realized that, uh, that she did, she did, she looked fucking beautiful with her bald head, man. So, you know, it was a traumatic event for her, but it ended up, uh, it ended up not being so bad. Um, <clears throat> so we get to the summer and, uh, in August, she started, uh, the, the new chemo that was even stronger. And at this point she's like a hundred pounds soaking wet. And, um, uh, mentally she, she wasn't really there anymore. She would forget, uh, you know, she would forget entire days. I'm sorry. That's there's here. She would forget, uh, like the entire days and she was just demoralized and crying. Hey guys, quick break right here just to check in and thank each of you for listening to the show. Your support has been paramount and I appreciate all of you. I have one request though. I need you to share the show with everyone you know. 
help me get the word out and spread these stories as far and as wide as we can. While you're at it, please leave a review of the show wherever you happen to listen. Feel free to reach out to me at any time to share your story, to talk, or to pass on suggestions. Let's get on with the rest of the show. Um, I'm, so, I'm sorry, dude. I'm so, I got to back up. So at one point when I got her out of the shower and I was getting her dressed, she was crying and she asked me for a divorce. And um, she said, you know, this wasn't fair to me. And she was dead ass serious. And she said, it's not fair to you. You're like, you're 31. Um, like, you don't deserve this. You didn't sign up for this. And that's where she had gotten mentally. She was, you know, to the point now where she wanted to divorce me because of how sick she was and she didn't think it was fair for me. You know, and, and she's literally gets handed a death sentence. And she's worried about my fucking feelings. Um, that's the kind of woman that she was. So I told her, I was like, you can divorce me, but I'm not fucking leaving. Like, I'm not going to leave. I'm not leaving your side. I'm not leaving this house. Like, I'll quit my job if they try to make me come back to work. I don't give a fuck. Like, I'm not leaving your side. Um, so that's not, if you go on my social media, I have a tattoo on my right arm. Um, then I went and got shortly afterwards while she was still alive. And it's, a, it's a, her cancer ribbon with a, like a rosary cross hanging off the end of it. And it says, with faith comes hope. And I uh, came home with it and she was like, what's that for? And I'm like, it's not a memorial. Like I'm never, cause she told me at one point, she's like, I never want to be a memorial on your helmet. She's like, I don't care if I live or die. I don't want to be a memorial. And I told her, I was like, it's not a memorial. I was like, this is, this is my promise to you that I'm never going to fucking leave you. So I don't care if you divorce me. Like I'm not going anywhere. Um, so August, then August, um, we end up back in the hospital for like two weeks. Um, this is like the 10th time we've been at the hospital for extended period of time. And she's just like completely gone mentally at this point. Um, get home for a little bit. She starts having headaches and, um, her getting worse and worse at a point where she can't stand up. She hadn't had a shower in weeks. Like she felt terrible and I couldn't, couldn't stand her up. So I call one of my buddies who was working at a fire department down the street from my parents' house part-time and, uh. I was like, look, dude, we got to get in the house the hospital. Like, I think, I think we're getting close to the end here. And, um, so <clears throat> he puts the ambulance out of bypass where he was, puts it on bypass, basically puts it out of service. And, uh, he rallies up a crew from my volunteer house and they come over and, uh, cause she told me, she's like, I'm not getting, a, I'm not getting an ambulance. Like, you're not, you're not putting me in an ambulance. I'm like, all right. So they come over and they bring a reef stretcher. Um, we get her, we get her down the steps. We get around to the back of my truck. I bring her up to the truck or I bring her up to the hospital. And I, you know, some, I asked some cop to watch over for a minute and I, I run inside the hospital and charge nurse that she'd already known me by name by now. I said, Hey, Natasha's here. I was like, you know, she needs to go straight up to the oncology floor. I said, she's not well. So we get her upstairs and, uh, they shut the whole room down again for us. And the next day I'm. I walked out to do something and, um, I was talking to the, the nurse and I walked back in the room and, and, uh, in that five minutes that I was gone, she'd had a massive stroke. And, um, so she's looking up for me from the bed and, um, you know, one eye's crossed, facial droop, like can't use one side of her body. She's slurring her speech. And, uh, I walked back out. I'm like, Hey, I was like, uh, Pretty sure Natasha had a stroke and they're like, what? I'm like, I'm like, I'm telling you, like, I, I'm just a dumb fireman, but I'm like, it's textbook dude. Like, and she's like, Ryan, I have to activate the stroke team. And like, you don't have a power of attorney over her yet. And I'm like, you know what you got to do. But I said, the first motherfucker to walk to this hospital room and tries to get her out of this bed with the amount of pain she's in, I'm going to flatten him. And she's like, all right, well, let me call one of her friends down there on on the stroke floor or whatever. And, uh, we'll, we'll start some imaging or whatever, start whatever. And she was like, you need to get your lawyer up here ASAP. So, you know, Natasha, was, she was still half smiling, laughing. She was obviously, she was actually in less pain now that she had had the stroke. Um, and, uh, so we have to explain to her why there's a, you know, a lawyer coming up to do a power of attorney and, for her to sign her will and everything. It's not something we talked about because we've been, you know, so focused on fighting this whole time. And, um, 
So the lawyer gets there and they needed two witnesses that weren't related to us. And they, they, they bring these four ladies in the hospital room to, to witness her signing us. And, you know, just the amount of effort it took for her to sign it. And, I mean, you can just tell she had this massive fucking stroke and, uh, both of those ladies are crying and it was confusing Natasha. Um, so we get a sign and the oncologist comes up and she's like, look, if this was my own daughter, she was like, I could, I couldn't, um, I couldn't do anything else for her. She was like, because anything else is going to make her life more miserable at this point. I think it's time to take her home and put her on hospice. And, um, so I called her sister and told her, and I was like, look, you need, you need to come up here. Like, um, uh, you know, Natasha's she's going to come home and she's going to go on hospice. And, uh, so I had to have this conversation with her. You know, and I'm talking to her about hospice and she's like, I don't understand. She's like, am I, am I dying? And I'm like, as a fireman, I know how I would answer that. You know what I mean? Or blunt matter of fact, but I'm like, how do you tell your fucking wife that? And I'm like, cause in my mind, I'm like, I thought we both knew this was, you know what I mean? Like, I, I don't know how to, how do you explain that? Like, so I, I sit it down and I'm like, look, this doesn't mean you're done fighting. It's just. Right now, there's nothing more they can do for you, and it's time to go. I said, do you want to be at home and comfortable in your bed, or do you want to be here in the hospital? She was like, take my ass home. So I call my buddy, and they get an ambulance from my volunteer house, and they, I'm assuming they stopped at Target or somewhere, and they got a fucking mattress topper, like a memory foam one to put on the stretcher for her and get all these fucking fuzzy-ass blankets and pillows and um, basically I took her on the last ride home, uh, got an ambulance to Christiana. It's about an hour north of her house. And, um, they drove, somebody drove my car home and then they drove her back to the house, licensed her in the ambulance. And, um, when we got there, they had taken the hospital bed and what was left of my half of the section all that fit in the, in the living room. They put all that shit upstairs and they moved our entire master bedroom set down to the living room. Um. So that way she could be in her bed and it was set up just like our master bedroom. Um, and they had done that before we got there. So get her in bed, the hospice first comes and, you know, uh, you know, at this point she's fading pretty quick and I remember she, she was unconscious for a while and she woke up and she looked at me and yelled at me and she was like, well, where, where, where the fuck's my IV bag at? And I'm like, you don't give hospice patients a ton of fluids because it just makes it worse. And so I'm not telling her that. I'm like, oh, uh, she's like, how am I going to fucking get better to get chemo next week if you, if I'm not getting hydrated? I'm like, okay. I call the hospital. I'm like, I don't care what you got it. They're like, we got to have some kind of bag dripping over her head. Um, So she falls back in her, you know, she falls back asleep and we're giving her morphine and giving her the head of van and, and, uh, she starts going down the tubes and then she starts getting the death rattles. Um, you know, she's gurgling on her own fucking fluid and you can't wake her up anymore. And the hospice nurse, um, she was like, look, um, she could be like this for several weeks. And I'm like, are you fucking kidding me? She was like, I've seen people like this for upwards of 14 days. Um, I'm like with, with the death rattles, gurgling, the fucking labor breathing in a coma. And I'm like, so she leaves. Um, and I just remember praying. I'm like, you know, at this point, like my relationship with God is pretty stressed. Um, and I just remember being like, dude, like this fucking woman suffered enough. Like there's, there's enough suffering and fucking pain on this planet to go around for all of us. She doesn't deserve any more of it. Oh, uh, so it was September 14th and it was, uh, two something in the morning and, uh, you know, I'm, I'm watching her pulse on in the forties and at this point she's agonal breathing and, uh, so I got to where I am. Uh, when she took her last breath and, uh, and, uh, obviously 
I was fucked mentally after that. Um, you know, but then I had to plan for the funeral and I wanted to make sure everything was perfect. And I, this whole time I'd been in caregiver mode and I haven't, you know, given a second thought to my mental health. Um, you know, so we, you know, the funeral happens and, you know, there's a fucking thousand people there that have been following the story for the last seven and a half months. And, you know, my fire department brothers are there that had supported me for the last seven and a half months. And, um, and then I acted like nothing fucking happened. Um, I went back to work a couple weeks later, ran a couple calls, realized, nope, I'm not ready yet. Cause I fucking took those sick leaves and, and uh, Still ended up going back to work like a month after that. And, uh, <clears throat> you know, up until this point in my career, I wasn't phased by the shit that we saw at work. And I think, you know, my whole life, I've been good at just kind of pushing shit to the back of my mind. You know, I think most men get to that point where they just like, you don't want to address mental health issues or, or things that might bother us. Like, you know, the build our whole life to suck it the fuck up and just move on. And I thought that's what I needed to do. And like, I, you know, I work with some of the hardest motherfuckers in the fire department or at my warehouse. And I'm like, I, you know, in my mind, which it wasn't true, but this is what I thought was I can't talk to these dudes about this shit. Like I can't, you know what I mean? Like I would crawl down some fucked up halls or hallways with these guys, but never in a million years would I think about trusting them with the shit that was on my heart or mind. Um, so I just sucked it up and, um, it wasn't, obviously it wasn't the right answer because here we are talking to each other. Um, so I remember running, the this infant CPR on the medic unit and, uh, the baby was still alive and, uh, it looked like it was going to be a bullshit call. Like dude's like, oh, my baby's got diarrhea. We're like, all right, we get on the medic unit. And I'm like, look at this baby, you know, her skin's gray. I'm like, man, so I take her jacket off and I check her pulse and it's like 40 in the forties. And I'm like, uh, again, I'm just a dumb fireman, but I'm like, Hey man, I, I think we have to do CPR on this baby. And the medic's like, you know, it's one of my good buddies. And he's like, what? And I'm like, and the dude, the dad's standing there and the baby's alive looking at us. And, and, uh, so he puts the pads on her. He's like, fuck dude. So we, you know, call the CPR and work this baby the whole way to the hospital. And, uh, I remember standing in the children's hospital and there's a crowd of people while the doctors are working on this. I mean, there's probably 50 people in this room. They're just working on this baby. And ultimately like the baby uh, passed away. And, uh, I remember at the same time thinking like, why, why doesn't this bother me? Like it doesn't, it doesn't bother me. Like I wasn't affected by it. You know, you know, the, our critical incident team comes out and, uh, you know, anything, anytime something happens like that, they get a little the SISM team, we call them the scissor team. They fuck come out and they want to talk to you immediately. And I, you know, I briefly caught some of that podcast with the guys from 32 engine. It's like, dude, when shit like this happens at work, we don't want to fucking talk about it right now. Like we need time to process this shit and digest it. And I just want something like they said, I just want to be somewhere comfortable that feels safe to me and sitting in the fucking office, you know, with people in my face talking about, well, how are you feeling right now? Like, that's not it. That's not how it works for firemen. Like this, I don't think that's how it works for most people. Um, so I walked around for a long time thinking that the CPR didn't bother me and, and you know, until just recently, but now I'm getting calloused and angry at these people at work. Cause I'm like, you know, why the fuck do I have to Narcan this dude? Every, every fucking, some of these people, every shift we're Narcan and bring it back to life. And then they just go on being a career crackhead. And I, and I say that now, and I'm not trying to sound like a dickhead. Cause obviously I believe there's value in all human life, everybody. But at the time I was so broken. I'm like, why did Natasha have to die? Why does she have to suffer this miserable ass death? And then I got to come to work and deal with these motherfuckers that are calling and, you know, and deal with all this shit. And it just got to the point where I was just angry, but I just get callous. And I'm like, man, I can't, like, I couldn't stand coming to work. And, uh, I just had no compassion. I had no compassion left in my body. And I'm like, I'm not sad or depressed. I'm just fucking angry at the world. Um, and, and I, 
it got to the point where I thought about leaving the job because I'm like, we're not doing anything. Here. We're not going to fires like we used to. Like, obviously, I was never going to the fires like these dudes used to back in the 90s. Um, like, we're not going to any fires. They keep making these dumbass rules to make work more miserable. Uh, we're running these medical calls all day and all night up and down the road. I'm just getting burned out and I have no bedside manners anymore. Um, and then, uh, on July 30th in 2018, my buddy texted me and, um, he's like, Hey man, are you sitting down? I'm like, uh, yeah, actually I am. And, uh, one of my instructors in the academy, um, I'll say his name because he's so no shame what he did, man. Steve Acton, fucking phenomenal fireman, uh, smart dude, well loved in the fire department. He fucking killed himself. And uh, I don't know that it humbled me. Um, I was definitely confused why someone hit, like, because you just don't expect that shit to happen. You obviously know that we deal with this shit at work all all the time, and you know all of us are fucked up in some way or another. Um, but when he killed himself, it kind of opened my eyes, like to how I was living my life. And, uh, and, uh, I was like, you know, baby, maybe I need to reach out and get some help. And, um, so I, I start trying to go to therapy and, uh, you know, I, I can't find somebody I click with. So I'm like, of course, you know, I don't think I went to like two therapists. I'm like, oh, I can't find anybody like fuck this shit. I'm just going to, you know, keep self-medicating and keep going down the path we're going on. And, um, so Steve kills himself and, uh, and then I realized like my mental health had taken a shift to the point where like, um, like I couldn't get out of bed in the morning. Uh, I was calling out sick a lot, you know, and these dudes are depending on me to come to work so they can have, you know, a solid crew on the back step on the side of the truck. And, uh, you know, I was milking back injuries and I just. I wasn't too, I was before this happened and I was using it as an excuse. I'm like, well, you guys don't understand. Like my fucking wife died. That's why I'm fucked up. And, uh, you know, the self pity kind of took over my life and I fell into like this deep depression. Um, and, uh, in 2000, like towards the end of 2018, I got into another relationship and this girl had had some mental health issues of her own and she kind of initially pulled me out of that funk. Um, and, and, and she was someone that I trusted to confide in her about stuff that I'd never told anybody before. Um, you know, stuff that I was going through mentally or stuff that happened while I was with Natasha. Um, you know, she really made me feel safe and because she had been through some similar fucked up shit or in her life and, you know, some serious trauma, like I just, it felt good to let that stuff go. Um, but obviously I wasn't getting the help that I needed. So that was short lived. And, um, so fast forward through all the missing work and pulling out sick and, you know, just getting burned out. And I was probably miserable to be around because I'm showing up to work hungover as fuck all the time. And, I'm um, drinking every night, having to take hundred milligrams of Benadryl with alcohol just to get some sleep. At some point that stopped working. So then I was taking Ambien with TOs to try to get some sleep. And, uh, you know, that's not a good combination. Um, it has, as a, you know, as a fireman and as her man, I was, I was failing miserably as a human being. Like I was letting the dudes down that I worked with. And, uh, so November of 2020, it was actually Thanksgiving morning. We were back in the ladder truck up in this neighborhood and, um, this dude clipped me with his car. So as he's going by, I punched the side of his, he clipped me with it. So I punched the side of his car and he rides up on the sidewalk and he gets out of his car and he pulls a gun on me and, uh, something, I don't know if he dropped the cell phone or if he dropped the mag or whatever, but the tiller minute, the ladder truck was like, yo face heads up. And uh, so I dive in the ladder truck and, uh, we, haul, you know, we haul ass out of there and we're laughing about it back at the firehouse. And, uh, as the shift progressed, I'm like, you know, like, what would that do to my, she was my fiance at the time. What would that do to her if I didn't come home from work? And then I, I thought about, you know, if, if it was reversed, if that happened to her, 
I was so mentally broken at that point. I probably would have fucked killed myself. And I'm like, I don't know where she was. You know, I can't speak for her. She's not here. Um, but it, it broke me like, and not in a good way. And, uh, and then I was just completely checked out on work mentally. Uh, so at this point now I'm, I'm crushing a handle of Tito's on my three days off. And when I would run out of that, if I drank it, you know, faster than three days, uh, I was, I would drink every bottle of wine that was in the house, every beer that was in the fridge. Um, I was mixing sleep medications just to be able to try to shut my brain off at night. And, uh, I wouldn't say I wasn't suicidal, um, just because I care so much about my family and my friends, like I would never do that to them. But if I had, if something happened and I'd have died, like I, I just didn't want to be, I didn't want to be at work anymore. I didn't want to be here anymore. Like I just had no, no purpose. Um, at this point, it has her fiance. I'd completely fucking trail her mentally. Um, and, uh, I was, you know, using my personality cause I, you know, I get along well with everybody and, uh, I think I'm a likable dude. And, uh, I was using that personality, you know, to find my spot at the day room table, basically. So like people are not like, you know, let's do the piece of shit, blah, blah, blah. Like, you know, I'm just staying friendly with everybody, just trying to manipulate everybody. So I could kind of fly under the radar as this fucking broken alcoholic that's showing up to work and contributing fucking nothing to the firehouse. Um, so end of summer 2021, um, I'm at rock bottom. And I remember several shifts, I was driving to work at three o'clock in the morning and, uh, you know, the IFF, the IFF center of excellence, you know, the rehab center is just outside of DC. I have their website pulled up where it's like, click here. If you want somebody to call you right now. And I would drive to work with no music, just crying. And I'm like, I need to press this button. Like I need to get help. And I, you know, several times on the way to work, I was in that position where I'm like, I might actually still be drunk driving right now to DC and assume duty. And, uh, basically just praying for a miracle, but still at this point, unwilling to accept ownership that it's not anybody's job to fucking save me. Like it's your responsibility. Like, yeah, you can reach out and ask for help, which I hadn't done at this point. Um, but in the end, you still got to put it to work. And I, I just, I don't know if I was praying for a miracle or praying that I would fucking die. Um, but yeah, I was in a bad spot and, uh, I had a bad shift and I came home and I told Haley, I'm like, Hey, I had a fucking bad shift. Like we need to get some more beers. Um, so we go, we go to the Mexican spot. Uh, I get some targets and margaritas. I get fucking hammered. We go to the bar after that. Her and I ended up getting an argument and, uh, I, I broke, I absolutely lost my mind. Um, we get back to the, so I'm hammers. I drive back to the house, which is right around the corner. And, um, we're arguing in the car and I just went berserk. I fucking punched my rear view mirror through my windshield. I punched out the screen, in my center console. Um, um I'm yelling at her. Basically I'm blaming her for the way that I fucking feel. I'm, you know, I'm gaslighting the shit out of her. And, um, get back to the house. I'm like, you know, fuck you. I just sat and I'm, you know, push the door in the house and she's looking, she's, she's looking at me like bewildered. Like this, this dude was my peace, man. This is my person. Like he made me feel safe. And I can't believe what I'm looking at right now. And, uh, so because I realized at this point that I'd fucked up, um, you know, I, I hate to even admit this over the fucking air, man, but I got to take accountability for who I was at this point in my life, dude. So I'm not going to do anything with it, but I grab a gun and a bag and I'm like, I'm fucking leaving. Like I'm going to a hotel. I'm, I'm done with this. Like still blaming her for the way that I acted and, and the shit, the, this, how I felt was somehow her fault. And that I'm at a time. And, uh, you know, we get out front, she takes the gun from me. And she's like, Ryan, you, you can't, you can't drive right now. Just come inside. We'll figure this shit out in the morning. Like you got her, you got, you're so spun out right now. You have to calm down. And, uh, she grabbed me by the shirt and was trying to pull me inside. And I grabbed her hand off of my shirt and it wasn't my intention, but it happened anyways. And she ended up on the sidewalk and it, I, I remember looking at her on the ground and 
my whole entire life, I've, I wanted to be like my father, like this patient, loving, caring man, still absolutely obsessed with my mother. Um, just a good man. I wanted to be a good man like him. And I refused to acknowledge that I was fucked up for so long and it got to this point. And in that instant, I, I took that, I took that away from myself. And I, you know, even in the moment, like I tried to deflect and I'm like, well, you know, that wasn't my intention for you to end up on the ground. Well, it doesn't matter, dude. It doesn't fucking matter at the end of the day. That, that was me. I did that. And, um, something snapped inside of me after that. I was like, I, you know, I have to make a change. So I stopped drinking and, uh, I went to work. I called my lieutenant on the way to work. And I was like, we got to pull the guys aside. I was like, I, I'm fucking broke. And I don't think you guys realize how fucked up I am right now. Like how far gone I am mentally, like I, something's got to change. And at this point, like, I don't have the strength to dig myself out of this hole and stay here and continue to take these runs and deal, you know, with the nonsense that we have to deal with, uh, you know, working in that part of the city. And, uh, so he's like, okay. And, uh, you know, I sit down and talk to him. I tell him everything. And, uh, you know, obviously he's fucking disappointed. Um, but he was like, dude, like, you know, we all kind of knew this day was coming. Like we're, you know, the shit that you went through was absolutely horrific. And, um, he's like, obviously you should have got help a long time ago. He was like, but we are here for you and we got your back. So I, you know, pull everybody to the front of the ladder truck. I think it was after morning cleanup. And I, I told him everything and I was like, I, I gotta go. Like I, I have to really, there's a lot of shame in transferring from a house like that. And I, I had been thinking about it for well over a year and I hadn't done it because I didn't want to let the guys down. Like mean, those dudes saved my lifeline and Tasha was sick that they provided for me, they, they took care of me, they gave me time that I was able to give to my wife while she was dying. And I was, I felt like I, one, I felt like I owed them. And two, you know, I was ashamed of, of admitting that I was so broken that I had to transfer out of there. And, uh, so like, where are you going to go? I was like, I don't know. I said, I need to research because I still want to be on a good ship. You know, I still want to drill. Um, but I have to get away from this coal mine for a little while and the stuff that we deal with. Um, you know, while I learned fuck myself. And these are some of the hardest dudes in the fire department. And every one of them were understanding about it. And I remember like, just like the first time I shaved my fucking head and they're like, damn, man, you should have done that a long time ago. It was like, I had the same, I was like, damn, I should have done this a long time ago, but I was afraid I was ashamed. And you know, they made, they made me feel like there was no shame in it. They, they, you know, instead of being the hard asses that are, you know, ball busting each other all day long, they were my family. And they were like, dude, we understand you do what you got to do. And we will be there for you. And then, you know, of course, words present the fire department fast. And I started getting text messages from other dudes on other shifts. Like these are guys that I consider some of the baddest motherfuckers on the job. And they're texting me. They're like, Hey face, I heard what's going on, man. I love you. You're a brother. I support you. If anybody's got a problem with it, let me know. I'll punch them in the face. Um, and they were there for me. And I'm like, why? Like, if I had have just taken that step a year prior, when I thought about it the first time, when I realized that I was broken, maybe it wouldn't have gotten, you know, this bad. Um, so I transfer up to truck 12 and got a great shift, great chief. And, uh, I kind of started working on my mental health, stopped drinking for a little bit. And, uh, and then I got lazy because I, at this point I had no purpose. Uh, I had just given up on myself. I'd gotten away from the shit that was driving me down. Um, and I, you know, there was no motivation there and I was lacking discipline too. Um, so the, you know, went down the same path. I started drinking again. Uh, not as bad as I was previously. Uh, and it got to the point where I realized I, I like for real needed to sit down and make a change. And I knew that I had to walk away from my relationship and she's not here to defend herself. So I'm not going to say anything that came from her side, but from my side of the relationship, I had completely failed her as her man. Um, and I was at the point mentally where I just, 
I, I couldn't focus on her any longer. Like I had to walk away from the relationship. Um, so I started weekly therapy and, uh, I'm sorry, man. I've been talking for a long time. Did you want to jump in? No, you're good, dude. I, okay. I wasn't, I was not going to interrupt. I, I think that the only thing I was going to say was, all right, once you got through that, like what road did you go down and, and you, you started it on your own. So I really don't need to guide you there. Yeah. So it, it was, I was staying out of your way and letting you tell your story. All right. So this past October, you know, I, I started going to weekly therapy and I found a therapist that I really clicked with. This lady's a fucking angel. Um, that she challenges me. Uh, I started, um, I've been more vocal about the shit that I've gone through because I know that if somebody was more vocal, you know, in a way that related to me, uh, with stuff that they went through, it might've gotten me to open up sooner. And that's where I went in my life and, and, or, you know, this career, this past, you know, a couple of years where I, you know, fell down this rabbit hole. That's nobody's responsibility. I'm not blaming anybody. Like, well, if they had just opened up, I, this would have never happened to me. No, this happened to me because I, I made it happen to me. I let it get this far. It's my responsibility. I didn't feel safe opening up. And that's my own fault. That straight cowardice right there. Like when you're at the point where like, you don't want to be here anymore and you don't say shit, that's cowardice. Um, so that's all me. But I, I wanted to make sure that I've been through all the shit and in my, in my head, I'm hearing Natasha saying, you know, like, what are you doing to better your life? If you're not doing anything, I don't want to fucking hear about it. Um, so I'm like, I went through all this shit. If I, you know, if I just keep my mouth shut, so I'm sorry, shut. And I don't speak about it and I don't offer the story up to people and I don't, you know, potentially save somebody else from going down the rabbit hole that I went down. Then what was the purpose of her suffering? What was the purpose of all this shit that I went through? If I'm just going to sit here and feel fucking sorry for myself and use it as an excuse to be a piece of shit at work, um, or to have to bail out of a busy firehouse to slow down because, you know, I'm, I'm not mentally strong enough to fix myself and, and not because I wasn't mentally strong enough, but I was too fucking lazy, um, to actually do the work required to dig yourself out of a hole like that. And I, you know, I thought medicating, self-medicating with alcohol was going to be the fix, but, um, so I start weekly therapy. I walk away from my relationship, um, you know, which was hard. I, I feel terrible for the things that I put her through because of shit that was out of her control. I mean, obviously like on her side of the relationship, there were some contributing things. Um, but that's not what we're here to talk about. They were here to talk about me. And, and I, um, I brought a lot of unnecessary, uh, stress and and bullshit into her life that she didn't need either. And she stood by me for a lot of it. Um, so yeah, so weekly therapy, uh, talking about it more. I got this morbid ass tattoo on my left arm now. It's, uh, it was a cover up from some dumb shit I got when I was in the Marine Corps, but it's the, it's the DC, it's the Capitol building with the DC flag behind it. And then there's a leather fire helmet and it's got the, um, semicolon, like the metal health thing on the shield and then it's got a skull of a fireman you know in the helmet with a pistol on his mouth and you can see the pistol in his mouth on the lower part of my upper arm and uh it's uncomfortable to have that tattoo on my arm i can't tell you the amount of old ladies that stare at me and judge me when i'm out in public um but two guys now on the job have asked me about my tattoo what the meaning of it was and i just told that story and he's you know i'm, I'm not going to say any names um you know, the one dude that broke down about, you know, his son being killed and how he was basically drunk 24-7 um, and uh, had been for a long time and had just given up on his life and his marriage was failing. Um, and then there was another guy who was actually struggling uh, with thoughts of suicide. That it was a guy that I would look at him like, I would have no idea. And he had been through some really messed up shit with one of his children and uh, felt like he had failed as a father. And... Uh, yeah, that's why I have the tattoos because, like, I feel like I need to talk about the story. I need to tell the story because there's guys out there right now that are self-medicating, that are suffering, that are thinking about killing themselves, that are in my shoes, that might be past where I was or might not quite be there yet, um, that are afraid to get this off their chest. And I'm, I don't care. People can make fun of me for transferring. They can make fun of me for coming on your podcast and getting choked up talking about my wife or talking about the shit that I've gone through. 
I don't, dude, yeah, it doesn't, I don't care anymore. Like I want to talk about it. I want guys to know and the women on the job that there's no shame in it. Like if you for real need help, there's absolutely zero shame in reaching out or doing what you got to do, leaving a job, transfer firehouses, whatever you need to do, um, to, to get the help, to get the help that you need before you drag other people down with you. Um, and it starts with accountability though, because at the end of the day, um, we're, it's not your, you know, your coworkers or your friends or your family's responsibility to save you. They can help you. They can help you get out of that rabbit hole. They can help you dig yourself out of that rut. It's not their responsibility. There's no fucking hero coming to save you. Until you recognize and look in the mirror and state, and, you know, tell yourself like, hey, it's up to me. Like nobody's coming. There's that quote. Nobody's coming. It's up to us. It's up to you. It's up to you to take that first step. And if you're scared, there's no shame in it. And if you need help, you can come to me. Because I'm obviously, everybody's heard of this now. Because uh, I'm told you shit on this podcast today that nobody knows. Um, I got your back. I'll help you start that process. And I'm telling you, some of the dudes you look at this job are the hardest motherfuckers out there in the fire department. There's, there's those dudes out there have your back too. The ones you think are going to bust your balls, they're not. They're not going to do it. Like, but you have to make, you have to take that step to get that help. And uh, right now where I am mentally, I haven't been this solid mentally since before I was in the Marine Corps. Um, but it's a, it's an everyday thing. I have to work on it every day. I have to wake up every morning and realize that it's not my fiance's fault for what happened in the relationship. It's not anybody's fault for what happened with Natasha. It's my fault for the way that I've reacted and the way that I've carried myself the last almost seven years. Um, I have to do that every day. It's a lot of work, um, but it's it's worth it because I mean. Um, yeah, I mean, life, it's just, we all, it's the shit that we have to deal with work, we all deserve the best when we go home on our days off and our family deserves the best version of us. So whether you go through something completely fucked like I went through, or you're just burned out from the traumatic shit that we see every day at work, like you and your family deserves to be better, but you have to take that first step. And... The, the peer support team is there for you. Um, I haven't dealt with it recently. I know, you know, back in the day, a lot of guys were apprehensive because it was kind of like in your face. And you didn't want to be there. You know, they were making guys stay at the firehouse at four o'clock in the morning after a critical incident when all they want to do is go home and be with their families and be with their children. Um, so I haven't, I haven't dealt with them in several years. After listening to that podcast with the guys from 32 Engine, uh, apparently it's gotten a lot better. Um, but if you don't, if you don't feel comfortable going to the clinic or reaching out to the peer support dealer, you don't want the chain of command now, reach out to one of your brothers, man, because I don't care how badass you think they are, how old school or salty you think they are. These, these dudes out there have your back. Um, but yeah, like I said, it's just, it's up to you to make that first step. I think, uh, I think I've rambled enough. <laughs> you know, there, there are two things there. That, that first step is, is, if you've never been to a therapist and you've never gone to somebody to admit, all right, I need some help with whatever it is you're dealing with. I don't care if it's you're dealing with what you went through or what I went through or what whoever went through or what maybe you put somebody through. It doesn't matter if you you're making that decision to say, I need help. That's a tough fucking decision. Yeah. You know, it, it, that first step is it's a, it's a hell of a step. And, and sometimes it takes a couple to get right. And sometimes you, you get it right, you know, right off the bat, you get lucky with that first person you talk to, but it's a hell of a step. And, and a, that's one of the best takeaways is it's just do it because once you do it, you realize that you needed to do it. And yeah. Then, it's yeah. All... I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, you're good. Go for it. No, I was going to say it's all. Uh... Like knowing you need help and actually taking that first step is uh, is one of the hardest plunges you ever take in your entire life. Because I knew I needed help for a long time, uh, but between being afraid to reach out and refusing to, to my ego got in the way. Um, where I'm like, you know what? Like, 
this isn't my fault that I'm this way. It's not my fault that, you know, my fiance was trying to keep me from drinking and driving. And when I, you know, yanked her hand off my shirt, she, I basically threw her to the fucking ground. That's not my fault. That's not what I meant to do. And I'm like, you know, I was blaming everybody but myself for the way that I was. And like, yeah, we go through traumatic shit and that's not our fault. But the way we react to it and the way that we live our lives after that, that's, that's our responsibility. And those two things is being afraid and my ego um, got in the way of me getting help for a long time. And it may take in that first step. It was agonizing for me. And I know there's a lot of dudes out there that are feeling the same way right now. I was going to say, there's no, there's, you're not alone with that at all. No, no. And, um, yeah, it's, uh, it's been a long journey, man. Um, and it's been seven years since almost seven years since the Dasha passed. And, uh, you know, I should have made, I should have made the first step a long time ago, but, uh, I didn't, and there's nothing I can change about that. So, um, the, the brotherhood is here for everybody, man. And I, you know, I owe this fire department. Uh, that was also one of the hardest things about transferring out of the fire. Well, I said it earlier is, is those guys gave me so much from the time she was sick, but it, it wasn't even them. It was the fire department as a whole. There's still guys in telestaff that I owe time for. You know, obviously you don't pay that. You just pay it forward. You don't pay it back. Um, there's still guys I've never met before. I've never even met. I've been on the job for 10 years now. I've never met these dudes that worked for me while Natasha was sick. Um, this brotherhood will save your life if you let it. Um, but this job will take your life if you let it. And, uh, it just, it depends on what step you want to take, where you, what direction you want to go in. And, uh, you know, I hope that the bullshit that I went through, um, and the stuff that I've learned along the way about who I am as a person and, and how easy it is to fail, uh, when you let the stuff eat you alive from inside out, I hope this story helps somebody else, man, because I owe this department. So I don't care who it is, man, whether you work for DC or not. Um, or you live across the country, whatever, like anybody could reach out to me and I got your back and I'll get you pointed in that right direction. Uh, but I'm telling you the dude sitting next to you at your neighboring table that you eat dinner with, that you're afraid to talk to about it. He's got your back too. Cause I don't think there's anybody on this job. that's not going to help you if you ask for it. It just, you got to swallow your pride for a minute and just take that first step. No, I think that's the perfect way to put it. Yeah, that's the perfect way to put it. You know, I, you, you had to take that first step. And, and then once you take those steps, I think, and I talked to somebody yesterday, um, one of the things we talked about was the fact that you don't come out of this cured. You come out of this with the tools to deal with everything. Right. There's not a cure. It's a, it's a, it's a, okay, this happened. This is how I deal with it. And now I'm better prepared to deal with it with something similar. If I, if, if it hits me later on down the road as well. Right. So I, I, and I think there's a misnomer that, that therapy cures you. It doesn't cure you necessarily, but it gives you tools. Oh yeah, absolutely. Um, um no, I agree with that hundred percent. Cause, uh, there's, there is no cure for this. There's no cure for your mental health. Uh, you can only get stronger. So you can either let this shit beat you fuck down and turn you into somebody you don't recognize, or you can use it to build yourself up and turn you into somebody you don't recognize, but somebody who's got the capability of helping other people too. Yeah. And uh, being present, being present for your family and the, and the community that you serve. Yeah, that's perfect. You ready for the last few questions? Yes, sir. You know what we call the, the show, the things we all carry. And, and the reason I do that is because it's based on a, a book that I've read a, a couple of times and, and it's called The Things They Carried. It's, it's by Tim O'Brien. And basically it's, it talks about things that this platoon carried into war in Vietnam and then the, the kind of the scars and, and things they took out of war. And so I bastardized that and, and created the title for the show. And the last thing, one of the last things I like to ask people is what's something you carry every day that if you leave home without it, you feel just naked. There's a cross that, um, after Natasha had passed and I don't, I don't necessarily carry it on my person every day. Um, but after Natasha had passed, I was getting some stuff ready for the funeral and I was, uh, I was feeling sorry for myself and I went to grab something out of this, um, out of the closet and this wooden cross came flinging out of this box and like landed at my feet basically. Um, 
I could actually, if you wanted to, I could send you a picture of it. It just says, uh, you're not alone on the back of it. And I don't, I think that somebody gave it to her while she was getting chemo and she had just stuck it in her little chemo bag that she carried with her. Um, but yeah, now it's, it's been in my vehicle ever since. And lastly, I don't know if you're a big reader or not, but I try to expose people to thoughts about reading and, and, and books that might benefit or just entertain. It doesn't, I, I really don't care if it's just for entertainment. Yeah. Is there a book you want to suggest to the audience? Yeah. Uh, men's work by Connor Beaton. Uh, he's got a podcast called man talks, but, uh, I just finished up that book uh, a couple of weeks ago and it's, uh, it's phenomenal for unpacking some of the shit that we as men stuff down into our shadows. I don't know if you're familiar with shadow work. Um, but it's a really, even me growing up with a great childhood, it brought a lot of things to, to light for me. Um, and it, it made sense to why, like a lot of my behaviors, even before all this stuff happened to me, uh, and why I was the way I was. Um, so yeah, it's called, it's called men's work by Connor Beaton. All right. Perfect. I, I, I haven't even heard about that one. So I, that's great. Yeah. His podcast is phenomenal. And, um, if I could, can I recommend one more book? Of course you can. So extreme ownership by Jocko. I just, I'm almost all the way through that. I've, I've finished it here in like five days now. Uh, if you work for the fire department, you're thinking about taking a leadership position. Um, this book, it's, I mean, it's self-help. Uh, extreme ownership of, you know, basically taking accountability for you as a person. And, um, it's really easy to read. It's, you know, the stories in it are great. Um, but yeah, if you're take, thinking about taking the leadership spot or get promoted, uh, extreme ownership by Jocko has it's been a phenomenal book so far. Yeah, I agree. Anytime you're thinking of, of taking a leadership position or, or you really don't want to have to step up to, to take an official position. Anytime you're, you're kind of leading, even if it, informal or formally, any kind of leadership book is going to help you And and Jocko's book has definitely been, it's one that's been talked about a, a few times on the show. So I appreciate that. Yeah. It's uh, something I've really been focused on, man, is, is just taking ownership for who I am as a person and stop class, you know, uh, placing the blame on everything that's happened to me and all the people around me. Cause like at the end of the day, we're not going to get better until we accept responsibility for ourselves. And, uh, that's something that I've really struggled with, uh, for a long time and i've used it as an excuse so yep it's definitely uh definitely a good book to read man i appreciate the conversation i uh i sat back and i listened to a hell of a story and yeah I'm, i appreciate you giving me the space to uh to put that out there man i'm kind of kind of nervous for this getting released um but at the end of the day man if it saves one person be it or help or not even saves it just helps one person get out of their fucking hole that they're in Oh, and it's it's worth uh, worth putting it all out there. Yeah, I appreciate it, man. I um, I, I will give you a heads up when it when it's coming out, and, and I'll give you some some prep time. How about that? All right, cool. I appreciate that. All right, man. Go take care. Uh, enjoy the rest of your day, and and we'll be in touch. All right, appreciate you. Take it easy. All right, man. Take care. There, and we're out. Thanks for listening to another episode of The Things We All Carry. Head over to the website, thethingsweallcarry.com, for show notes, resources, and to sign up for the newsletter. Until next week, take care of yourselves, and remember to check in on each other.